Hi, my name is Anna Bradley, and I'm the procurement officer with Mountain Rose Herbs. And I procure our teas and the majority of our European supplies. And I'm here today with Raj Babel of Young Mountain Tea. And I'm going to hand it over to Raj to talk a little bit more about Young Mountain Tea and the topic of today, the history of tea. Uh, Raj, welcome, and thank you for coming today. Thanks so much for having me. So I want you to tell me a little bit more about Young Mountain Tea and how you started that and why you're passionate about tea. And I have to say the Mountain Reserves was one of the first purchases of your tea. Is that correct? Yes, that is the case. Wow. Yeah, and I started the company in 2013, and it was about three years in that we began our partnership, which has been transformational for us as a very small, mission-driven importer of wow. teas. That's wonderful to hear. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that we're part of that. Yeah, likewise. <laughs> yeah. So tell me more about your passion for tea. How did you get into that? Sure. Well, it actually started more with a passion for community development. Um, I was working in northern India in the Kumaon region that sits right on the border with Nepal. Uh, and in 2013, I was there doing renewable energy projects because my background's in electrical engineering mm -hmm. and found myself really in love with the work of trying to understand what kinds of models for livelihood creation could exist at a village level. Uh, but I also found myself wanting to move out of engineering. Uh, so I was working with a nonprofit at the time, and they were working a lot with farmers because these are largely agricultural communities. So it made sense to explore something within the world of food or something that could be grown. And so I talked to this nonprofit about growing tea as a way to create jobs at the village level. And they said, yeah, we'll grow tea. We can help organize the farmers to plant some tea bushes and, and harvest them. But if we do that, you have to buy all the tea that we grow. And not knowing really what I was committing to, I said, okay, to that. And from there, we've gone. Uh, and so what we tried to do is work directly with farmers to do a fairly simple process of helping them raise the quality of their teas as high as we possibly can so that we can pay them higher rates for those teas. Uh, we then direct import the teas to bypass all the intermediaries who typically capture most of the value in the tea uh, value chain. And then we distribute them to wonderful companies like Mountain Rose so that we can uh, guarantee volume so that the farmers know that not only today or in this season, but into the future, they have long, stable relationships that they can rely on. Wow, that sounds amazing. So you're working directly with the growers of the tea gardens, is that correct? Yes, yeah, that's probably the most enjoyable part and where, for me, the most magic comes out of is the mm -hmm. direct relationships with the tea makers. Uh, Outside of COVID times, we go there twice a year, yeah. uh, once in the spring at the beginning of the harvest season and once in the fall, typically October at the end. Uh, and it's being there while the tea is being made, the smell of the green leaf that as is withering in the factory that really it, it stays with me for forever. And what I've learned in going back time and again to the same tea makers is that every season has its own peculiarities that influence what they have to do in the factory to make the best possible teas. So, what do you mean peculiarities? Yeah, well, for example, the rainfall from one season is going to, um, you know, the rainfall, the monsoon season in India typically uh -huh. happens June through August. And the timing of when the monsoon starts, as well as how much rain comes and at what frequency, really impacts the way the plants grow and therefore what compounds end up in the leaf. Um, one of the most day to day, so that's kind of in the bigger picture. Uh, in the day-to-day, -day, the ambient conditions uh, of the tea leaves as they're being harvested also really impacts how the tea makers process the green tea. So for example, if it's a really cloudy, overcast, humid day, they're going to have to employ a different set of practices than if it's a dry, hot day where the tea leaf is going to wither a lot faster. Can you give an example of what you mean by a different practice? Yeah, actually, I guess withering is a really good point, place to point. So yeah. that's, the, that's the first step in the processing. So after the tea leaf is harvested, it's brought up to the factory and laid out in these long beds or troughs and the uh, air is pushed uh, back and forth across the leaf. And the idea is to just reduce the moisture content that's in the tea. Mm -hmm. um, and that process is largely dictated by the relative humidity in the air. So if it's a super humid day, it's gonna take a lot longer to right. wither the tea leaf, which is also, I mean, as the tea leaf withers, there's other chemical reactions that are happening in the leaf, some of which you don't necessarily want to happen as long for, say, a black tea as you might for a white tea. Uh, so kind of reading uh, in one level the ambient humidity is a really important gauge for how to, say, start the withering process. 
Oh, that's yeah. fascinating. So it's all based on, on the climate and the ecosystem and what's happening that day. Absolutely, day to day. And that's the, that's the kind of goal, being there while the tea is being made and seeing the way that one lot processed from one batch of teas that came from one part of one garden, mm -hmm. the same batch of tea, sorry, the same uh, part of the garden's leaf, the next day might be a very different tea. And really? to be able to taste those side by side as they're coming out, that's, that's my favorite part of what we do. That's incredible. So you, you, don't, you don't ever know what's going to come out of it because every day is a new day. I certainly don't. <laughs> well, the uh, the tea makers, here, yeah, they also, yeah, they're, I mean, I guess it's, it, it is very much representative of the relationship between the things that we consume and the natural environment uh, and the way that the way one changes affects the way the other does. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, if, if the tea maker isn't really in tune with all aspects of the way the tea is grown, you'll taste it in the cup. And really? that's been... I feel like a lifelong study uh, that I'm at the early stages of, but even folks who are at the end, what I've appreciated in the tea world is the deeper the tea makers go into understanding the leaf, mm -hmm. the more there is a sense of reverence for what the tea plant is. And uh, that's a really encouraging sign. The deeper you go, the better it gets. <laughs> and, and can you sense that in a cup that you're drinking? I'm, I'd, I'd like to believe I'm beginning to develop those capabilities. Yeah, definitely. We're drinking some Nepali Golden Black right now. Mm, and it's delicious. Yeah, and this one has, um, I guess we were looking at the tea leaf before we started, uh, and there was a lot of the golden tip that makes yeah, the, that gives that. the tea its name. And uh, that's going to be a sign that the, the people who are harvesting the tea were really on top of the timing uh, because that bud is only at that maximum maturity stage for a day or two before it starts. Yeah, before it starts to open up and become a leaf. So it's really on top of the harvesters to know which part of the garden they should be at at what time of the week. And wow. because these are large, you know, tracts of land, getting to all the parts of the garden, again, just requires everybody involved to really be on top of understanding uh, what is going on right. to make the best teas possible. Well, what amazes me to think about um, the people who are with these plants every day are, are there every day with the land. Yeah. And so there's a deep, deep land knowledge. Is that correct? Yeah, definitely. One of our um, producer partners, his name is Desmond, uh, and he's in the Kumaon region in northern India, where I first started the company um, to work with, it was to work with the farmers in his region. And talking to him about the rainfall and its impact on plants, you can feel there's a deep emotional connection. Uh, and if it's been raining too much, which it has been right now, we're at early August, which is kind of like the midway point, of the monsoon season and it's been a heavy one in his region mm. and he's like oh Raj it's not good it's not good there's too much there's too much rain the plants are getting they're going under and and to hear the way that he struggles like viscerally wow. uh, with the rain as it relates not to him not to his well-being but to the plants, the plants. it is really incredible That's really beautiful. Mm -hmm. now you, we're talking specifically about Indian tea correct that's right and you source in India, and what are the regions that you source in? Uh, we source uh, from India and Nepal, uh, five regions total. Um, India has three very well-established regions of Darjeeling, Assam, and the Nilgiris. Mm -hmm. uh, so we find pioneering uh, tea makers in each of those regions to work with. And then we also really where the heart of our work is, is in the emerging tea regions, uh, Kumau in the northern part of the country, and then in the far eastern part of Nepal, which is typically just referred to as Nepal because it's really the only part of the country that has any tea production. So yeah, the five uh, that we source from, three of them are well established, two are emerging. And our approach is to leverage the expertise of the existing tea regions uh, that have been around for hundreds of years mm. to help inform the way that small farmers mm -hmm. can make high quality teas for themselves. Interesting. So you're talking about emerging regions and that, that tells me when you say that word emerging that these are new regions that never have been used before as tea growing regions. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a really good point. I should be saying re-emerging <laughs> uh, because tea did not traditionally grow in India. Um, the British brought it over from China. They stole it from China in the 1800s and they planted it. They stole it. It's a crazy story. Uh, yeah. What, Should we go into that? that <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, so I guess almost a step back a okay. little bit further. So 
in the year 1498, I'm pretty sure it might be 1499, um, Vasco da Gama, who was a Portuguese sailor, rounded the uh, tip of southern Africa, the Cape of Good Hope, and opened up the eastern part of the world to trade with Europe. Mm. Uh, and the British were not involved for about a hundred years until they captured uh, a ship that was coming into Europe and found the value of the cargo of that one ship was worth half the holdings of the crown. So the British, the British. captured a ship mm -hmm. in the 1400s. Yeah, uh, sorry, this was in the 1500s in the when 1500s. they captured. Yep. And they found what? Yeah, yeah. The, car the value of the cargo of that one ship was half the holdings of the crown. Wow. So that gave British merchants this glimpse into this hugely lucrative trade that they weren't a part of and prompted them to figure out how do we get into the action. So a group of merchants petitioned the queen, uh, and in response, she gave them a charter to set up the East India Company, which is pointed to actually as the earliest form of capitalism that the world has ever seen. Really? <laughs> yes, and they had a monopoly. Yeah, well, tea was not really initially part of the picture. It was, that came about 50 years later, okay. but in, yeah, in uh, 1600, when they got that charter to set it up, it was just to trade with the East. Mm -hmm. uh, Tea quickly became one of the most prized parts of the trade, uh, and by the 1700s, it was worth um, the the taxes on the tea import into Britain alone was 10% of all government revenue. So that'd be like today, like 10% of all government revenue coming from like coffee or something. Yeah. Can you imagine? It's yeah, it's mind blowing. That's, that's... And so it was it was the it was really the tea trade that was financing the growth of the British Empire. Uh, the problem was that all of the tea that they were sourcing came from China, mm -hmm. and the relations between the British and the Chinese were not good. Um, and they eventually de uh, fell apart and led to the opium wars of the 1800s. Oh. And that is really what prompted the British to look for an easier and closer supplier of tea. And because India was at that time already under the British crown, and you know, half the known world away, yeah. <laughs> or half as far away as, uh, as China, uh -huh. they began to explore where it could grow. And uh, they basically just planted uh, stolen tea seeds up and down the Himalaya, the Himalayas, looking for where it might do well. Um, <laughs> just dropping seeds? Essentially, yeah. They didn't, th this is the other crazy part about their story is that they were limited to trade on the coast. Uh -huh. So uh, very few Westerners had gone into interior China, which is where the tea is grown. Okay. So the initial seeds that they got out of China, they didn't know anything about them other than they heard that they had came from the mountains. Oh. At, that, at that point, they didn't know, for example, that black tea and green tea came from the same plant. They just thought they were two different drinks. Um, huh. And so when they first started planting those seeds, some of them were in this region, Kumao. And so initially, when during this ex really early stage of the British uh, industry, tea industry in India, um, Kumaon was planted out. Uh, it was then abandoned in the 1900s, uh, but there was a little bit of production there that was happening. And actually, Kumaon's kind of claim to fame was that the first ever Indian-grown tea to be drunk in Europe came from this region. From Kumaon? Yeah. Is that um, what we're drinking once again? Is it Kumaon tea? This one is from Nepal. Oh, uh, Nepali Yeah, and that actually, they really are emerging. Uh, that's not a re-emergence of a region. Okay. Uh, Nepal is coming online really in the last 40 years uh, from scratch. Uh, and kind of an interesting geographical tidbit is that uh, the reason, one of the reasons that Nepal exists as a country separately from India mm -hmm. is because it was the one uh, terrain that the British couldn't defeat the locals in. Uh, because Nepal occupies most of the mountains. The mountains, and, right. And the Gorkhas, yeah. right. Yeah. Uh, the local um, ruling uh, community, the Gorkhas, were known for being really fierce fighters. Wow. And the British, you know, being an island, mm -hmm. were not really well versed in fighting the mountains. So they never were able to kind of get into what is current day Nepal. And that's one of the reasons that it exists as a separate country. Interesting. Okay. Um, but yeah, so um, because it was a separate country, the British couldn't set up their tea uh, production projects. Um, and so it was only, I think it's the 1960s-ish that um, Nepal began to experiment with tea production. And mm -hmm. the king uh, bought some teas from China and planted them in the far eastern part of the country, right across the border from Darjeeling. 
So Darjeeling sits right on the, Nepal's eastern border with India. Uh -huh. And so literally it is the same terroirs, the same growing conditions with the same rainfall, the same soils, and largely the same communities because a lot of the uh, workforce that's in Darjeeling originally came from Nepal. Um, hmm. And so because they have such proximity to such expertise, uh, it's been really exciting to see the way these kinds of communities, when they be, decide to grow their own tea, they have a big heads up, or a leg up rather, on uh, their ability to, to make quality tea quickly uh, because there's such proximity and such knowledge exchange that flows between Darjeeling and Nepal. And actually, before Nepali teas were in the market as actual branded Nepali teas, the main market for them was to co-packers who are mixing them with Darjeeling teas and branding it as Darjeeling. So it was kind of used to adulterate Darjeeling teas before Nepal was recognized as being its oh, own region. Okay. So is there a, a, an obvious timeline or a time, I guess timeline that you would say of, of when each region started emerging from beginning in the 1800s, correct? With, with yes. Um, so, okay, I guess there's one really important part of the chapter that we kind of, I glossed over, yeah. which was so the initial seeds that the British got to India were um, kind of dead seas by the time they reached India. Mm -hmm. They had you know, been through a sea voyage and mm -hmm. were okay, but not top quality. So the British, they wanted to understand really the secrets of tea's production. Yeah. So in what is called the greatest case of corporate espionage that the world has ever Wait, seen, <laughs> The greatest case of corporate espionage that the world has ever seen, at least that's what tea people say, <laughs> uh, they sent a Scottish botanist in to steal living tea plants out of the mountains, convince local tea masters to come with him and come back to India. And so the Scottish botanist that got tasked with that job, his name is Robert Fortune, huh. and he was like a six foot four red-headed Scotsman that went disguised as a Chinese merchant. What? Deep into interior China. It's a, it's a crazy Why story. Why is there a movie about this? I don't know. There ought to be. I think that it, it's, it's definitely got all the makings oh, for yes. it. It's like a real Indiana Jones-ish kind of thing. And he's a botanist. Uh, yes, yeah, and a total botanical nerd <laughs> as well. Like, there's, uh, the, his journals exist. Um, and those have really long, florid descriptions of the river side and all the plants that were growing. And then he'll like casually mention, oh yeah, and we were attacked by a gang of five pirate ships that I had to fight off from my deathbed because I had the flu and I took out a, like a, basically a shotgun to take care of it. And that'll be like a small portion of his journal. And then he'll go straight back into describing all oh, how the beautiful orchids that were blooming wow. in, in the different seasons. Wow. And so it's quite a ridiculous story, but long story short, he was successful at um, transporting living tea saplings mm -hmm. out of the mountains, down the Yangtze River to the coast, and then by sea over to Calcutta, which at that time uh, was the British capital. Um, and so that was in the 1840s. So uh, to your question, um, the first regions to get developed, and they were kind of happening simultaneously, was Assam mm -hmm. and Darjeeling. Uh, Assam was the lower elevation uh, region and it's right on the banks of the Brahmaputra River uh, and the British actually didn't plant saplings that Robert Fortune had stolen but discovered the second indigenous home to the tea plant in Assam. So that's why there's actually two main branches uh, branches of the tea plant that we talk about. There's the Camellia sinensis, okay. var sinensis. Sinensis means of China. Those are the ones that are originally um, from China. And then Camellia sinensis var assamica. And that's the one indigenous to Assam. And so from the beginning, the Assam varietal, being at a much lower elevation uh, in a tropical climate, had way higher yield. So there's a lot of the quantity Wait, of- Why is it a higher yield? Uh, because the growing conditions are just so much more favorable oh, to the plant. Yeah. It's lower elevation, it's tropical, things are just like loving life and mm -hmm. going nuts. Mm -hmm. um, as opposed to the mountain growing Camellia sinensis var sinensis, which has to struggle at the higher elevation, uh, but it is that very struggle that creates the compounds that we really enjoy when we drink. So generally, the Assam uh, varietal creates these bigger 
richer, darker, more bold teas, okay. whereas the Chinese variety up at the higher elevations creates much more layered, complex, delicate, and nuanced teas. And so it's kind of a preference call. If you want the strength, you typically would go for an Assam style tea. And if you wanted something that was, had more like layers and complexity, more of the Chinese varietals. Let's go for. That's wonderful, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all that. Yeah, I don't think I answered the question on <laughs> the sort of the timeline, but yeah. basically Robert Fortune steals tea from China in the 1840s, brings it over, and the British had already begun experimenting with tea seeds at that point. Uh, but really the first two regions to come online are Assam and Darjeeling. Um, at the same time, they did plant tea down in the south in the Nilgiri Mountains, mm -hmm. uh, but for a variety of reasons, the industry didn't really mature until the Cold War in the 1970s. Oh, wow. um, so this is all very recent. Yes, uh, in the Nilgiris. In the Nilgiris. Yes. Nilgiris. Yep. Right. Right. And then there was places like Kumaon that were experimental plots that the British had set up, mm -hmm. uh, but a lot of those were abandoned because Assam and Darjeeling did so well and their close proximity to Kolkata or Calcutta, which is the main trading hub in the British mm -hmm. capital, made it much more uh, business viable for the British to set up their trade routes to get the tea from Darjeeling down to Kolkata or from Assam to Kolkata, then at that time to bring it from other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's a smattering of other regions that tried to kind of get up, but were killed in their infancy. Mm -hmm. And it's really exciting because we see those regions as the ones that have the most potential today. Really? Why? Because uh, basically the systems that were developed by the British, which are typically called the estate model, it's a really entrenched system um, that is really good at creating high volumes of very consistent tea, uh, but one that is also built on monoculturing entire mountainsides or huge swaths of land, which has long-term environmental impacts that we're now beginning to see on the soils. Um, and uh, the model is premised on the communities that actually grow the tea, the farmers themselves, not participating in the ownership of either the grounds where the tea is grown or the factory. Um, so who owns it then? Uh, typically, uh, larger multinationals uh, will own five or six uh, or 20 uh, gardens um, and kind of manage them remotely. Uh, there's often, of course, people from those companies that uh, work on the garden. Uh, but the communities that do the majority of the like work to actually grow the tea plant mm -hmm. uh, are totally reliant on the estate for their housing, for their education, for their health care, uh, for their food. And so, yeah, there's a lot of limitations to that kind of approach as well. And we're seeing those limitations come out in the form of strikes that are routinely shutting down oh. regions like Darjeeling and Assam. And so that's where we see this enormous potential for these other places that could grow tea, that have some history doing it, resurrecting those efforts, revitalizing them, and doing it with a community focus. And that's also really exciting because when it's done at a smaller scale, you can focus on quality instead of quantity. Exactly. And because white tea, green tea, black tea, oolong, matcha, pu'er, it's all from the same plant, we feel that the, the full potential of Indian and Nepali tea has never really been explored because it's been, it was kind of created to make black teas for the mass market. And they do a phenomenal job of that. Assam remains the most productive tea region in the world. Uh -huh. But what about all these other regions that could grow really interesting teas? And as the tea that we're drinking hopefully demonstrates there's a lot of good stuff that's already there. Yes. And to participate in working with companies like Mountain Rose Herbs mm -hmm. to help develop markets for these types of teas, we hope that we're issuing in the next generation of these types of teas. So your particular projects that you've been working on with the growers that you have, you are focusing not so much on the British model? Is that, your, is that what you're saying? Correct, yes. We're, so the British model is often kind of summarized as the estate model, mm -hmm. where a single entity um, owns both the land as well as the factory that, uh, where the tea leaf is processed. Uh, and they do that by monoculturing an entire mountainside. Um, the farmers that actually do the majority of the legwork uh, are not owners in either the land or the factory. Uh, and so they rely on the owners for their housing, for their food. Uh, so there's often a food subsidy program for their education, for their healthcare. And so it's not 
a healthy relationship uh, in the long run. Is this often. like plantation style? Is it? That That's uh, it's often called the plantation it model is. as well. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and we're seeing the limitations of that type of model, both environmentally and socially. Environmentally, uh, if you monoculture an entire mountainside right. and then mine it for all it's worth for 200 years, the soils become very weak, which trigger landslides, which is definitely a naturally occurring thing in the mountains to begin with, but we're seeing increased incidences in gardens. Um, and socially, we're seeing that there's just not a strong incentive for these communities to stay in tea. So the next generation is not. They're leaving and going to the cities to get so jobs. Know, okay, so people are losing their traditions there. Yep, and those that stay back are uh, often going on strikes, uh, which wipe out production. A couple wow. years ago in Darjeeling, it wiped out the majority of the second flush, which is mm -hmm. the really uh, the breadwinner for a lot of gardens in terms of um, earning enough to keep the doors open. So those are, that's the existing model, the estate model. Uh, what we are interested in, is it viable to have a small farmer model of tea? Uh, and we've seen from other countries like China and Taiwan that yes, yes, you can have an empowered small farmer make really high quality teas. Uh, but we haven't seen that in India or Nepal as of yet. And so the model that we're looking at is that rather than monoculture an entire mountainside, a community will dedicate a small patch of land or a, a kind of patchwork of lands to growing tea that's often interwoven with natural forests and uh, food growing plots of land. Oh, so it's like permaculture. Uh, yes, not not necessarily like with multiple plants growing on the same plot of okay. land, but if you took a more macroscopic view, it's certainly uh, more, much more interspersed intercropping. Um, and uh, yeah, so the, the, the tea plant itself is grown um, in a much more sustainable way. Mm -hmm. And the community has a vested interest in the outcome because they own the land. Right. Um, the big project is to figure out what happens if a community owns a factory. And that's been for many small farmers the biggest barrier because they don't have the funds to set up oh. a fully functioning factory. Um, and so that's one of the projects that we're most excited to be working on is in Kumaon in the northern part of the country working with the community there to set up the first community-owned factory. Um, and that is something that we have just begun to sort of move forward on. We've, there's land that's purchased, there's a co-op of farmers that has been organized, and we're really excited to be experimenting because that will be really the linchpin because um, in the creation of tea, there's kind of two steps. There's the growing of the tea, which happens, they call them tea gardens or tea fields, but they're essentially farms on the side of a mountain. Right. Uh, so the tea gets grown there and then it gets harvested and brought directly to a factory where it's processed into a finished tea. And the value add really happens in the factory. Because if companies like ours want to buy from farmers direct, mm -hmm. uh, their harvest often doesn't have any value. Because it's just, uh, until it's been processed into a finished tea, it's not commercially raw viable. raw material is not valuable. Exactly, yeah. We, wouldn't, we, we couldn't do anything with it. Okay. Um, so. If we want to deal directly with the farmers, they need to be owning the factory. Mm -hmm. uh, and so helping them find the funds to set that up and to do it in a way that is from the beginning oriented towards US food safety standards and has a higher quality level, that's really the most exciting thing that we're working wow. on. So mm -hmm. Along those lines, tell me about organic certification. Is that how easy is that for, for growers and farmers to do? Yeah, that varies a lot by region and uh, by organic certifying body. Uh, yeah. In our experience, uh, the challenge is for many small farmers, the funds necessary to um, get certified. Because it's expensive? It's expensive and there isn't a sliding scale for the size of the farmer. So mm -hmm. uh, there, there isn't a break, say, for somebody who owns half an acre of land oh, okay. and to maintain it. As well as like the organic certification is really something that's familiar to Western markets, but it's a foreign concept for a lot of farmers because often if by converting to organic, uh, they're gonna hit, have about a 30% hit on their yield. Right. They might have a 20% raise in price of what they can sell, but you can see if you reduce 30% and only grow 20%. Uh, for just that year or for then on out? Ongoing, yeah. Okay. Um, so that's a challenge to those that want to grow organic, but kind of are in touch enough with their 
pocketbooks to know that they're going to take a hit. However, the, the, the on the ground reality is that many small farmers who grow tea mm -hmm. can't afford pesticides to begin with or synthetic oh, okay. fertilizers, so they are organic by default. <laughs> and um, yeah, all, all of the teas that we uh, work with are organically grown. Uh -huh. um, most of them are organically certified, uh, but that has been done by helping band together groups into uh, a single certification that covers a number of them. And so that works in Kumaon, where there's sort of government support for that idea. But say in the Nilgiris in the south, um, it's a different situation where the small farmers are not as well kind of collectively banded, banded together. together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So do you see tea, tea growing as a social justice issue? Yeah, 100 percent. Yeah, I think you know, if we talk about creating equitable access to resources and opportunities, um, unfortunately, the existing tea estate is not oriented towards that. Uh, because the farmers, of the old British model. The, yeah, exactly. They're sort of locked into a way of doing things. And just to be clear, there's a lot of very empathetic, uh -huh. conscientious garden managers yeah. that are doing their best to take care of the needs of the people that rely the, on them. The world they live in. Yeah. yeah. However, I think it's the deep, more deeply embedded power structures. Uh, that have limitations. And so, yeah, thinking about how to create uh, more equitable opportunities looks like how do you treat farmers uh, as artisans? Like how do you make, not just view them as mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. farmers, but as makers? Uh, and I, I deeply believe the key to that is the factory, uh, because that, again, is where all the value um, that goes into, t well, okay, I should be careful here because one of my mentors has said, uh, quality is grown in the garden and lost in the factory. Okay. <laughs> so okay. yeah. not to say it's all the value happens in the factory, yes. but the commercial value is only sort of realized after the tea is processed the into a finished tea. The value is linked to the factory. Yes, yeah. But, but it's actually, the hardest work is done in the field. Right. Yeah. You're, you're actually growing the product. Right. And because... I mean, I kind of one of the incredible things about tea is that nothing gets added in the processing. Only water is removed in a controlled set of steps immediately after harvest. So huh. it's not as if there's being foreign things that are introduced. It is like the purest form of, it, these are the leaves of a mountain growing tree mm -hmm. that have been slightly controlled and then halted in their decomposition that we enjoy. And so because it's such a simple drink, really the health and the vitality of the bush as well as the harvesters sort of attention to detail and plucking just the right parts of the plant at just the right time are really as if not significantly more impactful on the quality as what happens in the factory so they're linked for sure Absolutely. Uh, but um, as i was saying we can't buy the green leaf we can't buy the harvest from the farmers, we have to buy from the factory because it's not a stable. Product. Yeah, it's not like a coffee bean where it can be kind of like stabilized, moved, and then uh -huh. locally roasted. Uh, for what we do, which is just import the Camellia sinensis plant, and we don't blend or flavor the teas at all. All the magic happens at origin, and so it's yeah. kind of paying homage to that yeah. and paying homage to the hard work of the farmers. We believe the first step is to have them be owners in the process. Okay. So, as as a purchaser as yourself, mm -hmm. or Sorcerer, I suppose. How do I say that? Okay. Sorcerer. Or sorcerer. <laughs> um, and, and you know, a company like Mountain Reserves, but also customers who are purchasing tea. How how yeah. how can we all support um, support the processes that you're talking about to help uh, these people be empowered with with their livelihoods? Yeah. Thank you. That's probably the most exciting and interesting question that I think exists in the tea, uh, and that I think is largely based around the role that we all play in helping consumers just know where their teas come from. Okay, yeah. So offering levels of transparency all the way up the supply chain to the farmer level yeah. to highlight this is the on the ground reality. Because unfortunately the way the industry is set up is that there's so many intermediaries that kind of confuse what's happening along the way mm -hmm. that we don't have a lot of insight into what's happening at the garden level. And I think that just people knowing uh, will transform what they expect and demand because ultimately, you know, this is a consumer-driven product. Yeah. And so, if consumers 
demand certain things that happens. And that's why uh, most of Darjeeling has moved to organic. Oh, uh, be, not because of, not, yeah, because they're taking a hit on yield that is not being compensated for in price, but the market has moved to organic. Really? So if we could have the same parallel happen for the social side of it, for the demanding of transparency and understanding of what's happening, who is growing the tea, right. then we would, I think, see the kinds of change that we're talking about. Well, and you, you visit the, the, the gardens. Uh huh. And you, you have relationships with the people who not only work in the factories, but also are the people who are picking the leaves, correct? Yes. And so how does that change, you, change your perspective on all that? Like, oh, well, what yeah, I guess what it changed my perspective on is I think in the U.S. we have this conception of tea as being this sort of dowdy drink that is kind of for high society uh, and kind of antiquated. Huh. And I think going there and seeing the reality that this is, it is hard, aggressive work to make this kind of refined experience that we're familiar with. It just shattered sort of my perception about this as being um, something that is classy into something that this is a people's drink. It's a yeah. simple, it's a simple drink. You know, they refer to it as an affordable luxury. Huh. And that's how I think it okay. should be thought of. Yeah, yeah. this is not something that needs to be cloistered or sort of reserved for only people of privilege or class, but something that is really, uh, I mean, it's, these teas are made by largely women. They're largely the workforce that um, harvests the tea on the side of mountains, right? Like these are, pretty intense aspects that they're working on with bamboo baskets strapped to their back mm -hmm. and reaching up at ridiculous angles with like sometimes up to 20 kilo, like 45 pounds of tea on their back. And just the amount of effort that goes into every single cup of tea, that's probably been the biggest game changer for me. As well as to understand that, yeah, we don't have to think of it as such a, um, like it's a fancy drink. It can just be thought of as like something that is just woven into everyday life. Uh, and um, both aspects of it, sort of the true reality of how much work goes into every single yeah. cup, as well as the fact that this is open to everybody to enjoy. And is uh, that your experience when you go there, that, that everyone is drinking tea? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, in India, and, and largely in Nepal, but especially in India, they drink chai. Um, oh, so they add milk, right. sugar, spices yes. to it, uh -huh. uh, but it is without a doubt the drink of the country. Okay. I mean, every roadside has four or five vendors. You can get it any house, and um, it's it's also very much linked to hospitality. So you know, if you're going for a walk, um, in a, like if you're going for a trek, say, uh, it's not an uncommon experience as you're wandering through villages for people to invite you in and to, to do that with a cup of tea. And I mean, it might be a different type of cup of tea. <laughs> uh, and you know, you might get this, like they have this um, kind of um, sugar that is, uh, and I'm trying, words are escaping me. Molasses, it's like a molasses uh -huh. yeah. uh, that you kind of like need to suck on in order to yeah. sl uh, get the tea down because it can be a little rough. But the gesture of tea is something that's, you know, it's, it's, as, it's as much just about offering hot water mm -hmm. uh, as yeah. you think it is anything else that it is yeah. definitely a bonding force for sure. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you for sharing, um, especially the history of tea with us today. That's uh, amazing to hear about the the crazy way it started and how it globally transformed the world. Um, and, and even today, are we, are we not sitting on a transformed world from tea? I certainly think so. And I, I think it's really exciting to work with Mountain Rose and other similarly value-driven people to feel that, yeah, it shaped so much of the way the world operates today and it still has the potential to shape so much more. So thank you for being partners in this. Well, thank you for the work that you're doing on the ground and with the people. Well, thank you for thanking me. Well, thank you. <laughs> no, no, thank you.